First thing I need to do is find out where everyone stands on Elm right now. How many people have never touched it? Raise your hand. Whoo boy, this is going to be fun. All right, you're in for a ride today. How many people have touched it? Okay, all right, good. So please, if you are sitting, if you have touched it and you're sitting next to someone who hasn't, please be willing to help them. Because I have, I've prepared about an hour of instructional material today, which will be broken up by time to, to catch up and do it on your own, all right? So, who's familiar with immutable data? Okay, who's familiar with Hindley-Milner type notation? Okay, so like Haskell-ish stuff. Um, good, who's familiar with currying? All right, great, we're gonna be okay. So even though you don't necessarily know Elm, you know a lot of the stuff that Elm does, okay? And so you could probably just follow along and pick it up. In fact, that's what Elm is designed for. It's designed to be a language that you can just kind of dive in and start getting stuff done without knowing what a bifunctor is. Uh, who knows what a bifunctor is? Okay, good, <laughs> that's fine. But there's something I have to explain first, okay? This is gonna be a like 12 second crash course on the Elm application architecture because that's extremely important to what we're gonna do today. And I assume, in designing the course, I assume that you already have a basic knowledge of how the Elm ar architecture works. Um, so that won't be what we're doing today, an introduction to that, other than right here on the chalkboard, okay? So follow with me. Here is, this E is the Elm runtime, all right? This is a piece of JavaScript code that, that provides all of the Elm application architecture that we're about to use. Now, there are a couple of very important pieces. This is your update function. Update. Actually, let me do a quick check. Who's used Redux? OK, if you've used Redux, then you should probably already be familiar with this. Here's an update function. There's a new type, an algebraic data type you make called a message. Okay, and then you've also got your view. And the view is also a function that produces HTML, okay, and this also generates events. Now, this event based architecture, your view will generate events in the form of messages. And these events will be messages that the Elm runtime is in charge of giving to your update function, okay? And then your update function in turn generates a new view. So very simply, yes. Can I translate into Redux? Yes, please do. OK, so uh, the update is like a reducers. Mm -hmm. And the message is like maybe a bound action creator or bound action. Exactly right. OK, and then the view is, of course, your, like, say, a container component. Exactly. Like your, your main, main like, component tree. OK. Perfect. Yep, that's exactly right. And the bound action creators, so you don't have to worry about that because the Elm runtime will take care of binding for you. Um, that's pretty nice, yeah. So, so what you do is you've got the runtime, you generate a view, you get events from the view that, that contain messages that go to the runtime. The runtime returns to the update function. The update function generates a new view. It's a nice little loop. That's just how it works over and over again. So the important pieces to, that we're going to be working with are a model. The model is what you use to, to generate the view, and it's what goes through the update function, OK? We're going to make a model. We're going to make some messages, and we're going to make uh, the view. Well, I'll show you that in a second. OK, so if you don't mind, everyone go with me to hipstore.sploding.rocks, which is named after my Twitter name, because I'm exploding socks, so it's a nice little pun there. Um, I'm working on my dad jokes. I have, a, I have two daughters now, so I'm like level two dad joke. How old? One is three months old, and the other one is three years old, just about. So, Does anyone have more than two kids? Okay, I'm expecting good dad jokes from you if you can, or mom jokes. If I think it's just three dads. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe hold those for after the camera has stopped. Okay. <laughs> Here we go, hipstore.sploding.rocks. This is going to give you everything you need to get started, okay? Uh, while I'm explaining stuff to you, why don't you go ahead, and if you haven't already, Go grab the template, which is up here on the board. It's github.com slash sploding slacks slash hipstore starter. Who does not have Node.js installed? OK, go ahead and get working on that if you can. There are instructions in the readme for how to, how to uh, install Node.js that should be available to all platforms. Um, you'll need Node.js to install the two dependencies that we're going to work with, which are Elm and create Elm app. It's just a, a nice little starter. Yeah. Is, are you using Elm like point one eight? The recent yes. Good because there was quite a lot of changes. In the right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Zero, zero point eighteen is the correct version to work with together. Tutorials. 
pre uh, 0 0.18 don't work anymore. That's right. Yeah, there were some, we're still in like the pretty drastic changes with upgrades state of Elm. Um, so here we go. Here's the deal. Yes, yes, it's written up right here. Exploding socks slash hip store dash starter. So go ahead and clone that and follow the instructions while I explain what we're going to be doing today. Um, when I started learning Elm, I had been trying to learn Haskell for about a year, and I had done pretty much nothing. I don't think I had anything compiling, which is probably still true. No, I've gotten like three programs to compile with Haskell. But in any case, I started using Elm, and it made a lot of sense to me. And, uh, but well, parts of it made a lot of sense. But once I started to try to do things that pertain to real-world applications, like making an HTTP request, uh, I got pretty confused. And I was like, I don't know how to do this stuff. And I, I ended up going on to the examples and pulling down some of the examples that were working and I had to fiddle with them myself in order to get it to work. It wasn't enough to just read tutorials. It wasn't enough to just read source code. I had to, I had to do it myself to kind of like break it first and then fix it up. So that's what we're going to do today. I've designed a little project that we're all going to build together and hopefully this will give you enough example from me and also fiddling around yourself to internalize how these steps work. And if you haven't touched Elm, then congratulations, because you're going to be riding a rocket pack to getting stuff done. Uh, the things we're going to talk about today are making HTTP requests, decoding JSON, which is another thing that people typically struggle with at the beginning, and uh, routing, or in other words, multi-page multi apps. So uh, changing what you show based on the location bar. And uh, it's going to be pretty quick. So let's, let's get going together. And here's the project. It's called Hipstore. We're going to pretend that we're like a, a nice um, design agency or a nice production agency. It has a client that's come to us and said, hey, you know, we've got this great store where we rent out hipsters for a day and they're associated accoutrement. And we're going to, typically this is renting for like, you know, li livening your parties or joining your family and your family photo shoots just to make things look fantastic. And we really want a, a, a web front for this. So um, pretend that We've now fast forwarded in time, and here's what our hip store looks like. So uh, you can come on and select your favorite hipsters. I really like Timmer. Timmer's pretty good at, at uh, dad jokes too. And customize the neckbeard. Yeah, you can actually. That's and that's Brickman has the uh, the long model beard. There you go, and he's shaved his neck. But um, you can also get accessories like the authentic antique Canon point and shoot film camera. And um, oh, Felix is cute too. Yeah, that's, he's one of my favorites. App, there, there's some uh, vegan, health-conscious, cruelty-free, dairy-free breakfast, um, which is great. Yeah, that, the, the waffles are also dairy-free, in case you're worried about that. And, and the limited edition runs selfie camera, which is actually just a GoPro, but it can cost more because it's labeled as limited edition. So we're going to put all that in our cart, and now we can switch routes, clicking on the cart button. And so we haven't actually changed HTML pages, right? We just changed the URL, the location, and now we've swapped what we're seeing. Now we've got our card, and oh, by the way, everything is charged in tacos. So I hope you've got some, uh, a good taco bank account because it's pretty expensive. Um, but let's pretend we don't have that many. We can go ahead and reject stuff, get it out of the cart. Now the whole reason I had you go to hipstore.sploding.rocks is that everything I'm going to talk about today is written right here. And we're going to be going through this. I'm going to be copying code from there because I'm not that confident in my own ability to write my own code uh, as I'm speaking. So the cool thing about this is that if you're way faster than I am, you can zoom right ahead and get everything done, and then you don't have to be stuck with me. But if you're also slower than I'm moving, feel free to just follow the documentation if you're, if you're not staying up with me. That's, I've written it all out there, so you don't have to get lost. Um, I think that that's all the preparation that we need. How are we doing? Oh, no, there's some more. All right. So I didn't want to waste any time in the class today writing user interfaces uh, because I had assumed that that's something you'll do separately. So I made a nice little Elm package called Hipstore UI. Now, all the packages that we're going to use today have already been installed in your project. So you don't need to worry about the, I'm not going to teach you about the package manager or anything, but that's neat if you ever want to learn about it. And I've got this gift that's saying, like, don't worry, the UI is pre-baked. Like, hey, it's already, just go ahead and eat the cookies. And that's what we'll be doing. We'll be using that. And this library exposes two functions and two types. The types are a product type. We'll go over that in a minute. A config type, which is just saying, like, this is all the info that I need in order to render a view. And then the two functions are a view for the products page and a view for the cart page. Pretty simple to use. 
Uh, and then the template you just downloaded has stuff installed already, and then it also has the application skeleton set up. So it's already got the Elm application architecture working. Yeah? Um, so how battle-tested are the instructions in the readme? Not terribly. What error are you getting? Uh, Elm make is it installed. Could not find Elm compiler. OK, did you do, let's go through them really quick. Did you do npm install dash g elm and create elm app? Uh, I think I may have missed part of that error. OK, and you probably, you need to do create elm at app at 0 0.6.3, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Yeah, I missed that. <laughs> Great. No, I'm glad we did. I practiced this the other night at the elm meetup, and uh, we had some problems. So hopefully it's been a little bit battle tested. Create Elm app at 0 0.6.3, I think. The first line of the readme, it says connect mdim install my g elm. Yeah, so I definitely installed that. OK. I just haven't run it. You haven't run which part? Uh, I guess create Elm app. OK, did you install that part too? That's installed. OK, great. So the next thing that we should be able to do right here is Elm package install. And it should tell you, oh, yeah, you've installed the packages. And then you should be able to say npm start. Yeah. Oops, hold on. I think I did type all that I'm getting up too. Is it possible? Is it, is it like a dependency on Xcode or something else? Yeah, so what are you seeing? What error are you seeing? Uh, I think that same one, like the Elm compiler. Yeah, I'm also OK. OK, that the Elm compiler doesn't exist? Yeah. Interesting. I wish I could have you display it up to the screen. So if you just do Elm REPL like this, what do you see? It could be that it's not in your path. You got to make sure that Elm is in your path, that the npm global install is in your path, and it could be that that's. You, you what? That opens that work for Elm Rebel. That works? Yeah, I'm forgetting that. Works? Yeah, I'm that. npm start doesn't work for you? No. Mm. Restart yeah. shell session? No, oh, yeah. I tried it. Could not find the Elm compiler, Elm make. OK, let's see. So there is one other option. No, there's not. That's not an option. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's not working out as I had thought. So if, if at this point, who does have it working? Raise your hand. Yeah, I want most of the class to have it working before we move on. Uh, if you still can't get it working by the time most of the class has it working, then we'll go ahead and you can continue with the book when you get to it. Who else is seeing errors as they're trying to get it? Sorry. OK, are you all seeing the same error? What's your error? Okay, and what are you seeing? Compilation failed. Error in source index.js. Wow, really? That's interesting. I did not expect all these diverse errors. What package is Elm app in? Uh, what package is it in? Oh, you mean like which Elm package? Elm app, yeah. That's. Oh no, yeah. So that's in the uh, that's in create Elm app npm install sg. Okay. Let node version there. Node dash dash version 730. 3.10.10 NPM. That shouldn't be a problem. So let, let me just double check with everyone. You've done um, NPM install dash G, both of these things, Elm and create Elm app, and you've done the specific version of create Elm app, right? Elm app, because we had problems with that the other day. Well, at you have to run create Elm app. You, you shouldn't have to do that, no, because that should be part of the NPM package. Got to make sure that your path has your NPM packages in it. Are you able to run create Elm app? Are you able to go to some directory and say create Elm app foo? Yeah, what do you see if you do that? If you L make, so it's another I have L make installed globally, but it's looking for the one under the create L map node modules directory. It's not there. So I can probably uh, yeah, like That's interesting. Um, you might try installing Elm just from the Elm website and not through NPM. Yeah, so I have another Elm map that I've been writing myself. Okay. Which is fine. But I'm not using any of the great Elm maps. So. What version? Well, uh, 0.18. So I've installed it globally, though, using yeah, it's, it's on the Elm web. 
Okay. What other errors? Are, are you able to do this? If you're having if you were having errors before, can you do create LMAP? Yeah. And get it that works? Okay, so if that's the case, if my project isn't working, but create LMAP does, go ahead and copy app. Actually just copy all of the source directory from my template into your new create LMAP and also the contents of elmpackage.json and you should be good to go. Okay? Anyone else? Group troubleshooting? Who's ready to go? Who's ready to move forward? Okay, so just four of us. Yes, that's correct. That's exactly where you should be. What you should be seeing... Also, I got a build to compile, couldn't find preset ES2015. Yeah, that's weird. So try installing npm install dash g ES preset 2015, what it says there. That shouldn't be necessary, but it has been for some people. Um, This is what you should be seeing if it works for you. Okay, any other errors? What are the errors you're getting? Yeah. Okay. That's the same thing you're having? So try installing it from the Elm, pack, Elm website if it's not working to install from Node for you. And that's elm-lang.org. I have Elm Make not installed as part of Create Elm App. Um, and Elm Make works as part of the Elm's app. It's just trying to um, invoke Elm Make. Uh, trying to run it from the Create Elm App node module. Mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to simulate it. I'll put a simulation in there. So another thing, you, actually, you can try this. If you're in here, you can say Elm App. I'm sorry that we're dealing with this. Elm App Eject. And what that'll do is that'll get rid of that runtime Elm app magic, and it'll just put a Webpack project in your root directory. And uh, I mean, it makes things a little bit more heavy to work with, but you can do this. And then once that's there, it looks like it's doing an NPM install for us. Once that's there, you should be able to do NPM install. Sorry, it's taking a long time. That's all right. I'm sure it's taking the same amount of time for you. Unless you somehow have a faster NPM. NPM, start. I mean, it worked for me anyway, but if that doesn't work for you too, you can modify your, well, let's see. Nothing? Not working? All right, so another thing you can do is wipe your computer, reinstall your operating system. <laughs> Elm app eject. And let's see, I'm going to look inside here, inside of my scripts. All right, and then we can try... Oops. Yeah, okay, so if you've done LMAP eject, instead of doing npm start, try doing node script slash start.js. If that still doesn't work, then we should all just go over someone else's workshop, I guess. <laughs> I'm joking, don't leave. Make sure you're not running anything on localhost 3000. Great point. I was doing that too. <laughs> 
Yeah. Then this right here. Yes. That works. Great. Right here. This one. No, I think it stopped. Does this still support the pop? Yeah, it does. All we did was break out of the the, the like pre-build tool that they had. So now you won't get any of their nice updates if they update create LMAP, but that's okay. Uh, I don't know. It's a great question. I am a Windows newbie. I know nothing about Windows. So I'm hoping that the node install uh, and the instructions well, helped. How are you guys doing with, with the Windows stuff? Okay. So if you've got Node.js on there, try following the instructions on the README. You're cloning down the GitHub repo and following the instructions on the readme. Okay, how many do we have that are ready to start now? All right, I think we're going to get started. That's only if you do LMAP eject. You don't have to do that. Yeah, that's only, that's only if stuff isn't working that you need to do that. But once you got it working, which it seems like a good number of people are, let's get started. I'm, I'm really sorry if you're left behind and getting installing stuff land. Uh, Hopefully you can, f you can catch up to us by reading the documentation. But you can also just sit back and watch because it should be fun to watch, all right? So let's get started. And I'm going to open up. What am I going to open up? I'm going to open up my editor right here, app.elm. We're going to do everything just in this one file. Now, normally you want to, when you're making an app, break stuff up into different modules. But we're not going to worry about that because we're going to be focused on just getting the stuff done today. We don't need to worry about scaling and organization and modules, right? Everything's just in one file. And we're breaking it up with these super advanced comments that say what part of the app we're editing. Um, and so here we let's give a quick overview just so you recognize stuff. Here's the model that we talked about. This is what we use to render our view. Init is just what the model looks like when the app starts. And then we've got our update function. This is the message I talked to you about. This is the type. This is the type that we're going to be sending, the actions that we're going to be sending through the runtime into the update function. And here's the update function itself. Now, each of the, this message right here, the only one we have available to us at the moment is no-op, which is just like, let's do nothing. And that's exactly what the update function does. It says, when I get a no-op, I'm just going to do nothing. It's going to be fine. And then down here is our view. Now, we're already using hipstore UI, and this is the config I talked to you about. This is all the stuff that Hipstore UI needs in order to render. And we're passing in default values for now. Here are some uh, event listeners, essentially. So this says, like, hey, when I click view card, I should fire this message. Right now, we just no op everything. You can't click on anything. And now there's this neat little library called remote data. Now, give me your attention for a second, because this is important, even if you're trying to get stuff installed. Remote data is an external library that we're using to represent data that we don't yet have. This is a really cool tool. We're not going to go deep into it, but I want you to know that this is a way of using data structures to represent whether or not you actually can move forward with your data or not. Remote data has diff four different types, and those are data you haven't asked for yet, data that you're in the middle of trying to fetch, data that had some error being fetched, and then data that you have. So that's all that is. We are going to store it on our, on our model that way because Hipstore UI expects that. It expects not just like a list of products, but it expects a remote data with a list of products in it. Just want you to know that so that doesn't seem weird. OK, you can go back to not listening now. <laughs> and the view, which currently is hard coded to rendering just one thing, which are the products page. Okay, And that's what you see when you pop open the page right here, localhost 3000. All you see is waiting to be told to load, because that is Hipstore UI responding to that remote data that we have the default we're feeding in there that says remote data dot not asked. We're saying, hey, we haven't asked for any data yet. OK? That's what we got. Now, here's our main function. This is the core of the program. This is like your Java public static void main, but it's simpler because it's just main. And uh, it's a type program. Don't worry about this too much. This is where all the pieces come together. We'll come back here in a minute when we're going to do routing. And i got to move fast. And I hope Julia don't die with battery. We're going to be fine. All right, step one. Step one, challenge one, is going to be displaying a list of products. Because we got nothing right now. 
we want to get a list of products down. So let's dive directly into making an HTTP request, okay? Now here is your first, like, what? If you're used to coming from JavaScript and not doing stuff in a pure way, Elm is a pure, statically typed, functional programming language. And that purity means that the functions cannot have any side effects. If you run a function in Elm, it cannot make an HTTP request. It cannot write to local storage. It can't even write, it can't even mutate the DOM. There's nothing it can do except for take in data and return data. And that sounds useless, but it's really great when paired with this, which is the runtime. The runtime takes care of all of those things, actually sending HTTP requests, actually mutating the DOM, actually writing to local storage. All that stuff comes from the runtime. It can communicate with the outside world. And the way it does that is by representing those side effects as data. So if we're going to make an HTTP request, if we were just in normal JavaScript land, we would probably download like the Axios library or use fetch or something like that. And we would say, make an HTTP request. It's immediately made. And then we say, when you're done, go ahead and call one of these callbacks. Or I'll use a promise or something like that. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to make a piece of data that says, sometime in the future, make an HTTP request that looks like this. And when it's done, go ahead and do this other stuff. So we're just making plans. That's all we're doing is when the, these functions from Elm, they're going through and they're saying, all right, here's the plans to do all the stuff I want to do. And then runtime, I trust you to do it at the right time in the right way and let me know when it's done. So that's the whole concept of purity. Instead of actually doing things, you're making plans and you're asking someone else to do them, which sounds a lot like management. So congratulations, you all just got a raise. <laughs> yep, great. Okay, so step one then is we're going to build an HTTP request and not send it. The very first step is to just import the HTTP library, which I've already installed for your, in your uh, template. Boom. We've imported it. <sighs> I wish I could say we're done, but there's a little bit more to do. Okay, let's add a request section right here with our advanced commenting system, which is inconsistent. Because, oh, no, it's good. It's all caps. I was going to say it's not all caps, and it's... Sorry. Side, side issue. What we've done here is we've defined a new value. Th this is not a function. Um, just if you're not familiar with Elm, a function would be like something that's like takes a string and returns a command, right? Oh, let's talk about commands for a second, in case you're wondering. A command is a side effect. That's the piece of data we talked about. That's the thing you build and you hand to the runtime to get something done. And a command holds a message. In fact, a command can hold anything. It can hold any kind of type you want, but it's only useful if it holds a message, okay? Because the runtime is only going to be sending us back messages. If you just, like, yeah, go ahead. Um, what kind of Adam plugin are you using? Oh, great point. I'm sorry about that. I was going to mention this. Uh, if you don't have Elm format installed, you can get it installed using Adam. Uh, this is a fantastic plugin that when you type, you can be super lazy, and when you save, it'll make it beautiful. It's super great. So Elm format, and I'm also using an op uh, another plugin called Elm Jitsu. It's only for Adam. Uh, Elm, what's it called? Jetsu. Elm Jetsu. Ah, oh, there's no dash. Elm Jetsu. If you want to, if you're using some other editor like Brilliant Vim or Lovely Emacs or whatever you want, there should be a way to get Elm format uh, for Vim for other things, okay? Uh, you can go ahead and do a little side project and get that installed because it's super useful. If, if the only thing you do today is get Elm Format installed, I'd consider it a success. Okay? <laughs> That's good. Um, thank you for asking. And in fact, I'm going to turn off my autocomplete, I think. Toggle. Oh, I don't know how to do that. Feel free to take any seat. You can disable the plugin. Oh, uh, this, yeah, which one? Autocomplete, right? Auto-complete. And then you can see how badly I type. Uh, Auto-complete plus. Disable. Oh, flying, flying crazy. OK. Uh, and here I was messing up stuff. I was telling you that this is not a function. This is a value. It's a command. This is something we're going to hand to the runtime. Uh, and a, so does everyone get the difference between a command and a message? Who doesn't? Who is totally confused about command versus message? Raise your hand. OK. So a command. Let's go, I'll just say this one more time, and I'll try to make it clear by talking more slowly. A command, <laughs> no, I'm joking. That's right. These, That's are, these are both pieces of data. A command is a wrapper for a message that says, like, go ahead and run something. Like, a command has got a bunch of plans in it to run something, and then a message at the end. That's what it holds. So a command we build, 
using libraries, we hand it to the runtime, and the message is the piece of information that you make all by yourself that gets handed back to your update. So message is not for side effects, it's just for normal like, hey, this is an event that happened in my app. A command is just for side effects, and you can build it using libraries like HTTP, okay? A command is a type that's built into Elm, and a message is a type that you're expected to define on your own, which we've done right here, type message. It's a convention. And when you see lowercase message somewhere, which you'll see all the time, that means like insert your own message here, which we've got, type message right there. All right, so first thing, get products. We're going to call HTTP.get, which is convenient, and we're going to pass it the URL for the server that already exists, which is API slash products on hipstore.now.sh, and we're going to go ahead and give it a JSON decoder, which we'll talk about in a minute, and I'm just going to type in decode product here and let it fail. So don't worry about that. Just put it in. We'll watch it fail in just a moment. And we're going to save, and we're going to see that there are a couple errors. One is that... Which one? The this? The decode product? No, no, the, the hip store now URL. Yes. It's just his syntax highlighting makes it really hard to save. I will fix that right now. What's, what's your, what do you like here? How about fizzy? Oh, solarized? Put the lights down. Ooh. Oh, good idea. It's actually low tech. Yes. Close to the door. That's for the camera. We've got to make sure for the camera. Oh. We good? Oh, I'm sorry. He's not going to see the camera. I think I have a brilliant countenance anyway, so you should be able to see me. <laughs> Hopefully. OK, let's go with, um, oh, oh, Solarize. Oh, but Solarize is so lab, color space. I'm just kidding. It's great. If you like it, we can do that, if that's your thing. Hey, that's pretty good, though. This is good. This is fine. You feel good? Does everyone feel happy? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> Okay, good. That's the goal. Retina searing. Okay, so you see that it's a string? We good? String we pass in? Okay, so one problem here is the JSON decode list is not imported. We're gonna, I'm going to use that magic plugin I talked about to add this import, JSON decode. If you don't have the plugin, you can just add it by hand at the top. All I did was import JSON decode right there. And we got rid of that first error. Second error is that it can't find the variable decode product. Now, this is a JSON decoder we haven't built yet. And I want to come back to it at a later time. So for right now, I'm going to define it in a horrible way by saying decode product equals debug dot crash. Oh, no. <laughs> and what that does is that lies to the compiler. And it says, you don't have to worry about me. I'm exactly what you want me to be. And then it'll crash at runtime. OK? That's fine for now, because we're going to come back to it. So the next error we see is that we've got an HTTP request, but we need a command message. I've given a type right here above the function, above the value that says it's of type command message. And the compiler is telling me, no, it isn't. You've got an HTTP request of a list of something. And I'm like, all right, all right, cool. I know how to fix this. And I do because I wrote the documentation. So I will tell you what to do. The next thing that we're going to do is add this line right here, remote data. Dot send request. Now, this is from that library I told you about. This is a handy dandy little function that says, when, I, when you give me an HTTP request, I'm going to turn it into a command. Uh, so if we save now, we see that, OK, cool, we've got a command now. But we're supposed to have a command message. And what we have is this useless command of web data list of something. And it's like, all right, well, just relax a little bit. We are going to add one more thing. Where did, where did that go? Oh, yeah, we have to map it. Oh, yes, thank you. That's right. So we need a message, right? We need to react to the fact that the HTTP request has been made. We need to tell the app what to do. And right now, the only message we have is no op. So let's add a new one. Let's go ahead and go to the documentation here and copy this. Now, in Elm, uh, we make an algebraic data type, very much like we do in many other languages that are similar by using this pipe, vertical pipe operator. So what we've done is we've now said that message is a type that can be occupied by either a no-op constructor or this product changed method. And this products changed message, I'm sorry, I keep mixing up all my terms here. This products changed message contains a web data of list product. And if we look down at the config, oh, it's not going to tell you. In fact, let's just go to the package documentation. Package.elmlane.org, exploding socks, hipstore UI. And you can see right here that the config type, the products are web data of list product. 
which is exactly what we have as part of our message. So that's great. So now we make this message and we save it. And we're also going to have to add, we would get an error about this if we didn't have an error up above, but we're going to have to add a field on the model called products. We can call it whatever we want, but I'm going to call it products. And I'm going to give it that type, remote data of a list of product. Now, product is a type that comes from Hipstore UI. It comes from right over here. Boop, there's product right there. So list product. And that's it. Oh, we're also going to have to update the init function because now we're going to, oh, it says that remote data isn't imported. Let's import it. Remote data, sorry, it's web data. Web data is just another, it's like a specific type of remote data for, for stuff over the web. And we've got that imported already. Now the problem is that we've added a field to our model that's not initialized. So we've got to initialize it. So we're going to say products is initially of type uh, web data dot not asked. Uh, is that, <laughs> I turned off my autocomplete, so <laughs> it's remote data dot not asked, sorry. I don't mind, I in fact would appreciate it if you notice that I'm doing things wrong and you tell me. Be like, hey, you're wrong, and I'll fix it. Um, great, so now we've fixed, no, we have to fix our update function, because now we have a message that has no, that we're not responding to, and we've got to respond to all the messages inside the update function. So let's go ahead and handle products changed, and that's going to have products in, inside of it. And we're going to go ahead and say, okay, when you get new products, Go ahead and update the model, and on the products field, set that equal to the new products value that we're getting in. And then we're going to do this fancy thing right here, this bang, this bang, and then the array. This means it's just fancy syntax. This bang is actually a function, and that function takes your updated model and a list of commands. But it's an infix function, so on the left it takes your updated model, and on the right it takes a list of commands. Now we don't have any commands to fire off when products have changed. We're just going to go ahead and update the model. So we save the file, Elm format runs, and now we go right back up to the top, and we need that, we need to turn this command of data into a command message. Now we've got a, com a message to work with. So let's go back to our documentation and see that there's another line we can add where we map over the command, and we tell it, okay, well, you go ahead and map over that command and use the product's changed me uh, message. Now, here's something cool. I'll make a side note. When you make a type in Elm, we're going to use this later too, when you make a type like this, type message, and you give it constructors, a constructor that carries stuff along with it also becomes a function to make data of that type message. So what we have is products changed is a constructor function now that can take a web data of list of product, and once it does, it will return a message. So that's what we've done here. We've done command.map. We've given it this function that turns a list, a web data of products into uh, a message, and now we get back a command message. Brilliant! So if we save this, oh, okay, so the next thing we need to do is send off this request, right? As we talked about how this is a side effect and nothing's going to happen until we hand it to the runtime because it's a command. So now we need to hand it off to the runtime somewhere. So we want to fetch these products right when the app starts. So let's go into our init. That's a great place to do that. And you can see that in the init, there's a place to do this. So we'll type in get products right here. Get products. Boom. And no compiler errors. It looks like we're good to go. Let's go ahead and give it a try in the browser. Reload the, reload the page. Oh, no. Debug.crash. I don't know if you've heard that Elm doesn't have runtime errors, but we just proved that it does. <laughs> because we... We just broke it ourselves. Uh, it, like web data? it should be installed for you. If not, here, like right at the top. Uh, do you have this import line? Yeah, I it, do. I do have web data. Oh, oh, shoot. Okay, I was importing wrong. I was trying to import it, like import web data instead of exposing web data. Great, great. Sorry about that confusion. I'm glad you got it. So now, sorry, we are going fast paced because we uh, we've got a lot to do in a little bit of time. There will be breaks after the implement more stuff on your own, and I'll be available to answer questions. But for right now, let's just buckle up and get through this thing. So we've got a runtime error, and that's because we're telling our HTTP request that when it comes back, it should go ahead and decode this data into a shape we expect, 
but we haven't given it a decoder. All we've done is tell it to crash. So this is where we're going to take a breath and talk about JSON decoding. Who has done some form of JSON decoding in their life? Oh, that's great. Perfect. Well, maybe I don't have to give too much of an explanation here, but let's go over it just for the sake of, well, for fun. Uh, have you ever seen this show, Hole in the Wall? Okay, <laughs> this is a game show where contestants see a wall moving toward them at a rapid pace with a hole in it, and they try to fit themselves into the shape that's in the, in the hole in the wall and try not to get knocked into a pool of water. And usually they don't make it through the hole, and usually the wall hits them and like breaks a little bit and then just throws them in the water, and it's good fun. Um, but this is a lot like JSON decoding, because when we're getting JSON data in, it's like this person, right? We're, we're sending this JSON data at this wall, and we've made a decoder, which is the hole in the wall. We're expecting that the JSON data we have is going to fit through that hole, that its shape is going to conform to our expectations. And if it doesn't, it breaks. But uh, as, it, as would happen in JavaScript or many other languages, um, it doesn't, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit. In, in other languages that don't take this decoding seriously, uh, you might just be free to take JSON data and operate on it immediately and assume things about it that aren't true. And then you get a runtime error because you try to access the field foo on there, the field foo isn't defined, you get a runtime error and it's just like, I don't know what to do, right? So what we're doing here is Elm forces you that bef before you can use any part of that JSON data, you have to make sure it fits the shape. And the, when you're doing JSON decoding, the type you get back from JSON decoding represents the fact that it could succeed or could fail. You get back what's called a result. Now, we won't have to see that because that's behind the scenes for what we're doing today. But when you are doing it, you get back a result which says either, hey, we succeeded and now we have the data that you expected. It fits this type. It, it went through the hole and here's your data. Or it says it broke and here's why. Okay? So that's why we've got to write JSON decoders. JSON decoders are all about making sure that the compiler is true to its word. Because the compiler wants to help you to do good stuff in your application, but it can't help you if it doesn't know that the, the things that it says are true. And it can't know at runtime about JSON because it's not available at compile time. So this is all about keeping the compiler honest and making sure that you uh, put your assumptions in the right place. So let's go ahead and play hole in the wall and write a decoder for this product. Now, there's going to be, there's an interesting pattern we're going to follow to do this debugging, and I don't want you to worry about it too much. If you're not already familiar with the functional pattern of applicative functors, that's what we're going to use. You don't have to know the name. You don't even have to know what happens. You just need to look at the code and be like, oh, that makes sense. I see how that's working. And later you can learn about the theory if you're not already familiar with it. Um, but we're going to do that using a library called JSON Decode Pipeline. And you know what? I am going to re-enable my autocomplete because it's going to make some things faster for us. Uh, and speed, time is of the essence at the moment. Um, auto complete plus. It allows me to import things more quickly. So here, the very first line that we're going to use for our JSON decoder is JSON decode pipeline product. Okay? I'm going to drop that in right there. Now, what's happening is this applicative functor pattern is saying, you should give me a function that takes some arguments. I'll wrap it up into a JSON decoding wrapper. Just think of it as a context. So I'll wrap it up here. And then you should feed me, one by one, decoders that match the arguments in that function. Once I've gotten all the decoders that match up with all of the arguments to that function, you're going to get a decoder that is the return type of that function. If that didn't make sense, don't worry. We're just going to go ahead and do it right now. Here's the step where we wrap it, where we wrap it up. We say, hey, we're going to start a decoding pipeline here and we're going to be decoding a product. And so we, we save it. And it's like, oh, I can't find JSON decode pipeline. We're going to import that JSON decode pipeline. And we should be good now. OK. And don't worry about this. This is failing because we're not done with this yet. In fact, let's go ahead and add a type here that says decode product is of type, uh, like it already knew, <laughs> JSON decoder of product. That's what we want in the end. Okay? And it's going to give us an error because we've only wrapped up this function. You can see right here, it's saying, you're expecting to get a decoder of product, but you've got a function wrapped up in a decoder wrapper that produces a product. Okay, so one by one, we need to start feeding this the information it needs. Let's do that. Let's go ahead and see that the first thing we need is a string. Okay, so let's go look at the type of uh, product from the documentation here. 
the first field, and this order matters here, the order of the fields that we have in a product for this type alias. Okay, remember earlier how I talked about the type constructor being a function that produces that type? Same thing with a type alias. If you have a type alias, it automatically generates a function of that name that takes the same number of arguments that are records in the field in that same order. So this first argument is a string, all right? And it's going to be the ID. So we can call this like product, ID, foo, uh, one, blah, and we'll get a product out of it. And that's about that's what we're about to do. So the first thing we need is the ID. So we're going to throw a pipeline, a pipe character in here. This is a pipe that says, all right, everything that's on the left-hand side of, the, of this pipe, go ahead and pass it into the right-hand side. We could talk more about that another time, but not today. Let's just, just follow it visually for right now if you're not uh, familiar with what it is, okay? So json.pipeline.required, we're saying that, okay, this is magic. This is a neat little function that says, I'm going to assume that the thing that you're decoding is a JSON object. And I'm going to assume, when I give it this ID field right here, I'm going to assume that it's got a field on it with the name of ID. And then right here I say, that should be a string. So it says, I'm going to assume that I'm going to get in an object with a field ID that has the type of string, and I'm going to pull that out. That's what that decoder means right there. This, this right here is of type JSON decoder string, which happens to fulfill the first part of this, that, that first string argument right there. We're feeding in a decoder to the wrapped function, taking care of that first string. So now if we save it, you see that, boom, we just took away one of those requirements. The next is another string, which is display name. Now, I know that there's a gotcha right here. You could discover it yourself at runtime, but I'm going to tell you right now. I on purpose made it so that the field names on the product type don't match up with the JSON. So if we go to hipstore.now.sh, you can see the JSON or the API documentation. Product has a field name on it, but no field display name. So we need to tell Elm that in order to get the value for display name, we're going to go ahead and look for the name field on the JSON. Yeah? Is there an easy way to modify decode product with something like debug.log or something for it to log to the console what the request is it's received? Sorry, what the response is so that you can fix up your decoder on the fly? There's a way, and it's not terribly obvious, but I can show you afterward. I'd be oh, okay. more than glad to show you afterward. Because uh, that's a. Can use like the network to have to sniff yes, that's another way to do it. But you, there's totally a way to do it, and I'll show you afterward. It's a great debugging practice. So here's the deal where we have like an Elm type that doesn't match up with the JSON. And I did this because I want you to remember that the JSON decoder, part of its purpose, is not to represent JSON as it came in in Elm, but to turn that JSON into something useful, an Elm type that you already have defined. So here, we're going to go ahead and do like we did above. We're going to look for the name. But instead of entering the name display name, which is the Elm field type, we're going to just enter name right here, which is the JSON type. Because remember, we're saying, next, look for a field name, get the string out of it, and that should correspond with the display name field on my Elm type. So we save it. And now we see that all we're lacking is a float and a string in order to get our product type out. OK, so float in Elm is called tacos. and in uh, the, the JSON is called price. So for the tacos field, let's go ahead and add another row. We're going to look at price on the JSON. This corresponds with the tacos value in Elm. And we're going to call this JSON decode uh, dot, it's a float, I think it is, yeah? Float. OK, let's look at our error. Now we just need a string. And this is fine. I know that this field is named the same on both Elm and JSON side, and that's going to be image right there, image. And it's a string. So let's save the file, and guess what? Wow. No compilers. <laughs> so let's run it and see what happens, yeah? Get Nothing happened. Yeah. Oh, a question. Uh, what if you're missing pipeline? If you're missing pipeline, uh, import pipeline. Yes, you can import it right here, JSON decode.pipeline. Sorry about that. So I'm like, all related because things are, yes? Um, uh, so order matters when you're doing that decode. Yes. Is there no way to like, assign to those, uh, like, uh, whatever the term would be, field names or whatnot? Yeah, so there are, this isn't the only way to do JSON decoding. This is just a convenient way. 
And this can, you got to be careful here, because if you just have like a record of four strings, you can easily get them out of order and introduce bugs into the application. But it is type safe. So if I were to swap float and string right here, I would get a compiler error because it's saying, I need a string, but you gave me a float. Um, the, the thing you have to be careful is with you when you have similar types, like a bunch of strings. You got to make sure they go in the right order. But there are other methods for JSON decoding too. And there's a great book on this that my friend wrote uh, called The JSON Survival Kit. And if you want to get it and talk to me afterward, I have a, a coupon code for it too. Yeah. Said, um, records, records are, are ordered, right? Correct. That's so weird. It's, it's because the records are actually a product type and the record syntax is just syntactic sugar. We can talk more about that too afterward. But it's got some nice conveniences to it. Okay. So now we've got this decoder and we were saying, oh no, because we were elated and yeah, nothing happened, right? It didn't work. But let's pop open the Elm debugger and it did work. We've got 25 products in here. That's because we forgot to update the view based on the model. So let's go ahead and jump into back into our code and we'll go down and see that, okay, this UI config that we're building from the model, we haven't actually referenced any fields on the model. So let's go ahead and take products and we're going to pass in model.products instead of the default that it was. Save the file and boom. Yay! Give yourselves a hand of applause. Now stop because we're not done. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is... Oh, right here. Sorry about that. Okay. So remember when we did the HTTP request, the model got updated. We did that earlier right here in the update function. We set a field on the model called products. And now if you go down to view, we're building this UI config based on the model. Before we were passing in a default value, and now we're bringing in the model and we're going to say, yep, go ahead and pull the products field off the model and assign it to the products in the config. And then we render the view. And so now you should be getting something up there. We good? Great. Where are we translating name into display name? Where? That's right here. Let's see. Let's go back to the decoder. So here's where we are saying, go ahead and find the name field on the JSON. And because they're positional, it knows that the second argument is corresponding to display name in the constructor. Any other questions at this point? I think we're doing okay on time. We've got about an hour left. Great. Either I've left everyone behind and this is the worst, or we're doing okay and everyone's having fun. Don't tell me which one it is, because I'm just going to assume we're having fun. Okay. What's next here? Next is getting the cart contents. We're going to now do something very similar to what we just did. We're going to make another HTTP request because we want to find out what's in our cart. But here's the catch. Uh, the way we have this class set up, Everyone is building clients that use the same server that's published live. And that server is going to have to accept requests from all of you. Now, it tracks the contents of your cart based on a session cookie. And by default, clients from a different domain from the server do not pass the session cookie in. They have to use a feature on XML HTTP requests in the browser called with credentials. You have to specify with credentials true to say, go ahead and send my session cookie along to the server even though it's not on my same domain name. That's, that's for server uh, security concerns, okay? The problem is that's not part of http.get in that function. It's not part of that function, http.get, and it's also not part of the function like http.post that we'll use later. So we've got to drop down a little bit lower level and go ahead and use http.request. Now this is one that just says, I'm not going to make any assumptions. You go ahead and build the request yourself using a record. So let's do that, and we'll explain it in just a moment. I'm going to drop this in in the request section right here. Uh, we'll put it below the decoder. Get cart. We're going to say build a request and use the get method. That's the first part. And then don't. this is a default value here. Don't pass in any headers. But we do specify that we want the URL to be cart. Like that's, We're going to say go ahead and make a get request to slash cart. Don't send in an HTTP, uh, HTTP body. That's a default value because there's no body to this request. But we are go this is the field where we specify our JSON decoder. We're going to say we do expect you to get back JSON, and I expect it to be a list of products. This is just like we did above. Oh, sorry, above right here. Right there, JSON decode list, decode product, same thing here. 
because when you go ahead and fetch the cart contents, it's just going to be a list of products. We're going to use a default value for timeout, which is nothing. And uh, we are here's the key. We're going to specify with credentials equal true. So that'll make your cart actually work based on your session token. And then we'll use the same commands we used above, remote data dot send request, and then command dot map. But you'll notice here we have this thing called cart change that doesn't exist. That's because that's another message we still don't have. So let's go make that message right now. Let's drop down to messages, and we'll copy products changed because products changed and cart changed have the same contents. It's just a list of products. Well, not I shouldn't say the same contents. They have the same type. Okay. So cart. Whoopsie do. Cart changed. So now we have a message called cart changed, but we haven't updated our update function. So let's go ahead and copy products changed and change that to cart changed. And we'll change this products field to cart. So we have cart changed, we get cart contents, and we're going to update the cart field on the model, which sadly does not exist yet, is what the compiler says. So let's go find model. And on the model, we'll add cart. In fact, let's just copy it because we know it has the same type as products, just different contents. And let's initialize it to remote data dot not asked. Now, in fact, instead of not asked, let's change this to loading to be more accurate because we have indeed asked, asked for these things, or we will be in just a second. Oh, I, just, I didn't specify cart equals remote data dot loading. There we go. You'll see that right here on init, we use the get products HTTP request command. We'll also throw in get cart in here too, because we want to get them both at the same time. OK, we've got no compiler errors. Let's see what happens. Reload it. Uh, well, I've added stuff to the, well, OK, this doesn't work. This won't work for you until we fix it up. But um, I think I happen to know that I have stuff in my cart. But it's not reflecting up in the UI. Let's go ahead and look at the debugger. Yeah, OK, so I do have a cart, success, list zero. I don't have any items in my cart after all. But I should, I, I should you know, be knowing that I got info back to the cart. And so let's go ahead and hook that up to the UI, which is the same step that we skipped last time. By going to the UI config and saying cart equals model dot cart. So now the UI is hooked up to the model, which uses the messages. We're rolling. This is, this is the design of the app that we want. Now, in order to make this useful, we still have to be able to add things to the cart, which is going to be a different type of HTTP request. It's going to be a post instead of a get. But we're going to cruise through it, because that works the same way as the get we just did with building this using an HTTP request. So I'm not going to talk while I do this. I'm just going to do it and let you follow along. Yeah. Yes. That's kind of like there's a lot of symmetry there with it. Is that like expected in Elm code that you kind of have that layout, or would that be like you would want to alias that at some point? So that's a great question. Um, and so you mean, for example, like web data list product? Would you alias that? Yeah. And you you totally could. You could say uh, type alias product list or something like that equals web data list product. And you could totally do that. There are no expectations around whether or not you use type aliases. Um, that's just up to your own personal style, as far as I'm concerned. But as far as like having multiple messages that carry the same information type, that's expected. Because uh, one complaint that people have about Elm is that it can be very wordy to write. It can be very verbose. And that's because it's a very simple language. It on purpose doesn't include a lot of the higher level abstractions and power that some other similar languages like PureScript may have or front end Haskell. It, it made the decision to be simpler uh, at the start with, at the cost of being more wordy. And there are reasons for that, which we could talk about later. But don't worry. If you're typing a bunch of messages that all have similar contents, it's OK. Your messages are just there to tell your app what to do. And it's OK if you find yourself typing similar things over and over, which we're about to do. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk while I did this, but I can't not talk because it's just me. So I'm going to talk. Uh, please let me know if you have other questions, too. Good?